Today we're going to talk about the 0.75 update. This is probably the biggest, most brutal and intense update I've ever done in re-entry. Uh, and it's uh, something we call TSS for Apollo. And what this really means is uh, that TSS, which is something called True Scale System, has been, uh, you know, the major uh, been taking the majority of the time uh, uh, when it comes to this update. So we all know that uh, from before uh, we saw the TSS update for Mercury. Uh, we saw a TSS update for Gemini. It had, uh, uh, I think, three major updates surrounding TSS related things last year, and this is uh, the final part. So uh, what TSS really is, is uh, kind of an upgrade of my old engine. Uh, Reentry, when it was released, it had uh, my own physics engine and it ha had uh, my own rendering bits. Uh, but then eventually as things grew and I started learning things, it started to get quite cumbersome to work with this. Uh, so TSS is basically a full rewrite of the entire uh, entire integration layer between the rendering engine and the physics engines. And when, uh, when I say engines, uh, re-entry is based on two different physics engines. One is uh, Gravity Engine, and then the second one is, is Lyra. And Lyra has both orbital, orbital mechanics as well as the physics that uh, you see in the interior of the cockpit. This is the electrical systems, this is the pressure in the tanks, uh, and all those kinds of things. So that's all Ly Lyra based. Uh, the old in integration logic was kind of the weakest point of my entire simulator. It, it was the thing that made re-entry feel really bad. Uh, so the benefits of the rewrite uh, can clearly be seen in uh, or even felt when you're playing Mercury or even uh, even Gemini. Uh, and if you play both of those some, uh, uh, and then you jump into Apollo, you'll see that uh, everything feels kind of cluggy, slow, weird. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors involved in the old engine. Uh, while in TSS, it's basically... Uh, uh, the easiest way to explain it is that it's a base uh, direct uh, mapping between the physics engine and what you see on the screen. Of course, there's a lot of tricks involved and a lot of things to make it work. But now we are more uh, working uh, more towards a one-to-one -one relationship with the physics engine, the size of the world, and and uh, uh, all the object that kind of orbits Earth or even the Moon in this case. But with TSS, and this is the final TSS update, with TSS behind us, I can finally start looking ahead of uh, what reentry could be, and. Uh, the TSS thing has been taking about a year of time uh, and it's been very uh, involved but now uh, with the TSS update I hope to kind of get the majority part out and then of course given this, the size of this uh, there's going to be a lot of things so this update might be quite fragile in the start but uh, we'll work out the quirks together uh, I want to give you guys the bit so you can start playing this and, and give me feedback. So another thing that this update uh, contains is a new campaign. So we uh, seen the campaign one, which is all Mercury based. And then we had campaign two, which is all Gemini based. And then naturally uh, for 0 0.75, I decided to include the third campaign in the series. And they kind of relate and uh, the third campaign is all about the command and service module. So I'm going to quickly show you that. And now I just need to verify because I'm using multiple desktop, desktops. So we'll see how this works. So this is in re-entry. And if I hit campaigns, you can see that we now have a new one here. I can hit select. And there's uh, some information. There's uh, uh, some story. It kind of tells you all the different components that the spacecraft consists of. And then it basically tells you to, you know, go to the academy and learn how to fly these things because uh, you will need it in this uh, 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 this campaign. So 
I'm just gonna show you the first part of this campaign uh, so you can get started with this. So, uh, I'm going to leave the cutscene at that, but this basically announces that I now have support for cutscenes in re-entry, uh, which means that uh, in campaigns, uh, of course, this is from my end, I'm now able to add uh, more cinematic experiences to the different campaigns. And I know that this video is kind of sad, uh, and, and in, in many ways it's, it's also kind of the beginning of... Uh, the new Apollo era with, with the block 2 uh, command module and, and the much safer parts of the Apollo things and, and of course a lot of changes involved there. And one of those things that I wanted to focus on is kind of the continuation of that, the, the first parts of the Apollo program. And this is basically before the lunar module came into the picture. And uh, campaign 3 is all about that. It's not about landing on the moon, it's about flying the command and service module, which kind of has the majority of this this update as well uh, when it comes to new things in, in systems. So, with that said, uh, I also uh, spent quite a lot of time on uh, the optics subsystem, OSS. So Apollo has three major things. It's the ISS, which is kind of the inertial system. And then you have the OSS, which is the optics. And then you have, of course, the uh, the CSS, which is the computer. And all of those, uh, these three major systems, they work together to kind of create uh, this, uh, or how, how do you see, communicate inside of the capsule, how things and systems work together to be able to navigate in space. Uh, the optics are basically the eyes of the command module. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just showing uh, this quickly as well. So now I'm going into, let's see, and I'm going to explain a couple of uh, things uh, as I go here as well. So if you now go into missions, uh, we have a couple of uh, new things here. We have, uh, of course, uh, a T minus two hours uh, free play mission. And I also have scenarios, which is more uh, snapshots or where you can just jump into a state and start playing yourself is like free play but it takes you into uh, a place so for example we have a trans earth injection which is Thai, and this state will just bring you into 
kind of a configuration that allows you to start doing that one thing if you if you want to train on that for example and uh, right now i'm going to jump into that state and we're going to spend a couple of minutes loading this and while it loads i'm going to you know take the liberty to quickly check the uh, the chat here All right, there we go. And uh, I'm going to bring the volume down on on the game audio here. All right, and as you can see now, I loaded into a scenario, and that's it. There's no more mission messages or annoying things like that. If you don't want that. But if you do want that, you can always create the mission yourself or play one of the missions that comes out of the box. Uh, let's see. Um, so, the command module, I'm going to bring it down even more. There we go. So, uh, I'm going to go into kind of a tour of the capsule pretty soon, but the first thing I wanted to just show is the optics. So there's a couple of things that you want to do when, when you get into orbital configuration, and that's to uh, remove the seats. So you can go in here and say toggle seats, and you'll remove them, and you can see that the capsule is now uh, without those seats. This gives you room to operate the capsule uh, more from uh, a lower equipment bay perspective. And you can see that uh, it now has all these panels here. Uh, there's a lot of things involved in this workstation as well. And in, if you're not focusing on the main console uh, above your head. And then you have a new disk key and this, this one actually works. So you can use this just as you use the other one. So uh, the optics, it has two things. It has a scanning telescope and it has a sextant. And this telescope is mainly used to kind of uh, scan uh, the stars and get a good uh, field of view. It has 60 degrees of field of view, I think, if I remember correctly. And uh, you can use it to get a good overview and uh, make sure that you're looking in the correct angle. So I can set the mode to manual and then I'm going to bring the speed down to actually medium. And I want to slave the telescope to the sextant. And now I can just click one of these and uh, you'll start looking through this. Uh, since I now entered manual mode, it's possible to slew this. You can use control and up and down to kind of uh, move this up and then you can rotate this using uh, left and right. So the mechanics of this is that you're not moving this directly like you're used to. You need to kind of move it up and then you need to rotate into the posi position that you want to. And for example, uh, since the star sky is all procedural, you can just go uh, into, for example, this star. I can put it into the center of the, the crosshair. And then I can change into the sextant. And now you can see that you are having a much more detailed uh, zoomed in view of that one star. The controls are, of course, very uh, sensitive, so you might want to get out and uh, set the, the speed to, for example, low if you want to operate in this mode, which is something that you usually do. One thing I'm planning on is to, of course, add some controls directly in here, maybe even reading the disk key and uh, setting the speed controls and sort of stuff like that directly here. So if I now get back into the telescope, uh, there's a couple of stars that are interesting uh, when it comes to the AGC. The AGC has a uh, set memory, and I'm going to just show you this. If I now open the map, uh, no, the mission pad, and then I'll go into, I think it's in checklists. And I can go down, you can see that there's quite a lot of these checklists now. You have a star list. And this star list is basically uh, an index and a star name and these are loaded into the memory of the AG AGC so you can use them to navigate uh, the night sky. 
So if I now go back into this, uh, I've uh, made a system that allows you to more easily recognize these stars. And you can see that some of these stars are having this halo around it, like a blue halo. This one uh, allows you to identify that this is one of those stars that exists in the AGC. I haven't done this yet, but I plan on adding a setting that you can remove this helper if you don't want to, and instead want to rely on your knowledge of the stars and the constellations, and uh, uh, of course how that entire thing uh, relates. However, if I now go in here across one of these, it will also tell you what star you're looking at. For example, Atria, which is index number 34 in the AGC memory. And this is very important when you run uh, the P52 uh, program. So, if I now go into the optics, you can see that this star is still very small, but it has this large halo around it that helps you kind of more easily track it because when you're in this 1.8 degree field of view lens here, it's kind of hard to track this, especially if you're in orbit around the Earth or the Moon, because then you're having a four degree of rotation, angular rotation, no matter what. So it makes kind of target targeting quite hard. And then you have a couple of buttons. You can hit mark if you want to mark a star, or if you're unhappy with your mark, you can hit reject. Uh, to cancel the mark and then do it again. But I'll get back to that pretty soon. Another thing that I did add uh, was if you go into the map view, you have uh, a star star map now in your mission pad. I want to make this, uh, of course, better. The moon map is just a texture. It's going to be a proper map eventually. And same with Earth, it's very basic. Uh, so it, it's all of this will change. Now it's more raw data and I use it as a tool. Things are a little bit misaligned. But of course, of course this is something I will work on uh, when it comes into uh, uh, the 0 0.9 update, which is all about polishing and doing stuff like that. With the optics, uh, you can do a couple of things. Uh, the most important thing you can do is to run P52 and uh, align your platform uh, with uh, an orientation you want to achieve, or you can uh, realign the gyros or torque the gyros into final line on, uh, based on uh, marks. So what you do is that you can mark a star and you can uh, uh, mark another star, so you need two stars, and uh, you will get an angle between those two stars based, uh, uh, and that angle will be uh, compared with the actual angle that we know uh, are those two stars uh, are separated by. And then you can see how precise your markings are, and if you can get a very precise marking, it means that your orientation uh, is kind of um, not correct, but uh, this is the orientation that you want to achieve. And then you can torque the gyros to that orientation to make sure that the attitude, the attitude indicator shows you is actually the orientation that you're having in space. So I know that this is a lot of details on these things, but of course it's good to know and understand what, uh, what this is all about. So you have a checklist for this, it's called the IMU Realign uh, checklist. The uh, P52 has a couple of uh, options. The first thing that we, uh, you will see is that you need to enter an option code. And there's a couple of option codes. And I've added the remarks on this. So for example, option one is uh, preferred. This will allow you to align um, the platform with the, uh, the burn direction that's uh, being planned through the maneuver planner and P30. And then you have the nominal. This is not yet implemented. It's targeted for 0 0.8. But this basically tells, uh, allows you to say, at this mission elapsed time, I want to orient my attitude uh, based on the log local vertical. And then uh, number three is to realign uh, with the rest mat with the IMU gyrus. So you, this is uh, where you have to mark stars. And then the lastly, the four is to be able to align it with the location on a planet. For example, the, the, the 
the place you want to land on uh, when it comes to moon landing. So uh, number four is also targeted for 0 0.8, but it's partially in-game already, but it's more automatic uh, when it comes to the lunar module, because you need this to land the lunar module and do the proper burning. All right, so it's, it's, a, it's a big checklist. So I've added a couple of aids. This allows you to run through this. So if you want to use P52 to align uh, with the preferred burn direction, for example, you can use this checklist. Or if you want to uh, get some help on uh, realigning the gyros with uh, the IMU, you can use this one. And this is basically just text on how it works and you can hit run and it will take you through the steps that are directly related to doing that exact thing. So this is just, just a tool if, if you want to get help uh, start with this. In 0 0.8 I plan to add tutorials uh, in the academy for this and the, the same applies for a couple of other things that we'll see later today. Alright, so we now talked a little bit about the op optics. Next I want to focus a little bit on uh, the missing, the big missing feature uh, when it comes to Apollo and that's the trans-earth injection. This is basically the burn that you need to do to get back home. And uh, previously, I've not had official support for this. I know that uh, uh, you're quite clever and you've been able to do this even without the official support for this. But now we, I've uh, provided tools to get more precise burns so you can actually hit the uh, specific point in the atmosphere. So I think that I'm going to quickly show you that as well and how that looks. And I can actually just use this one since I loaded the correct state. So, the tool that you want to do is uh, something called Request Tie. And this is um, a new maneuvering tool that I added that allows you to just uh, get an ex escape velocity from the moon and then figure out what perigee that escape velocity will take you once you get into the sphere of in influence of Earth. So, now I'm going to go for Request Tie. And you can see that this is a very simple tool. It kind of looks like uh, what you're already used to. And uh, uh, of course, it's just an experimental thing, but we'll learn as we go. And uh, of course, I hope to get your feedback. So for example, if I target a delta V of uh, 2967.59 feet per second, uh, I will reach a periapsis at Earth of 6500 which of course won't get you through the atmosphere. So this one, uh, you, given this orbit, I might have to adjust this one a little bit. You can see that if I now change this to something like this, you're uh, reducing this slightly. And you can just play around with these values until you found something that suits the orbit you're currently in. And this is all calculated based on your orbit around the moon. So this value will be different every time uh, based on that orbit and where you wanna uh, reach. And for example, if I now take this one, for, uh, this escape velocity fraction of uh, this, and I hit request, I'm now going to be able to get into the spacecraft and uh, start to plan the burn. So I want to use this lower uh, equipment bay disky. I don't know the actual name of this. We were discussing this in the Discord this other day. However, um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to use this one then and just to show that it works. So the first thing I want to do is to of course plan the burn. So this works exactly the same uh, way as any other SPS burn. Use P30 to calculate it. It's automatically added the values in here but if you want to modify it slightly you can. I'm gonna hit pro on that and I'm gonna hit pro there. And this is now going to show me uh, that I'm in a, now in an orbit of uh, around 60 uh, nautical miles uh, on the lunar surface and then I'm uh, uh, going to escape uh, because the apogee is neg negative which means that you're now in a uh, hyperbolic orbit. So that's fine, all seems good. And now uh, we're a couple of minutes away from the burn which is not very good because I spent a lot of time talking which means that um, I'm not going to be able to orient the spacecraft in time for the burn because the command module is very, very slow. 
by design. But uh, what I can do is to hit Pro here, and then I'm going to just quickly check uh, the rotation. I'm going to hit Pro here and maneuver towards prograde. Uh, this is now inertial, which is fine. And if you want to do P52 and align uh, the IMU, uh, you will have to be in an inertial mode because the orbital rate will overwrite everything and kind of disrupt it all. So make sure that you're in inertial mode. And then I'm going to run uh, program 52. And it's going to spend a little bit of time starting up and there is done. And I want to run uh, option one and that's uh, R2. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to change this to option one. And in real life, this was set automatically to one uh, by default if you had used uh, uh, some tool, for example, P30, ahead of this. So that's also something I, I want to implement. And I'm going to hit enter and pro. And this is uh, so some changes on the attitude and FDI. And I'm going to hit pro. And now this one is, uh, is aligned to the burn direction. So when you now do the burn, you all you need to do is to make sure that you're not retrograde, of course, because you want to get away from Earth. You want to reach to zero, zero, zero. And I'm just going to quickly help this because uh, right now the digital autopilot it's set to maneuver in two degrees, I think which makes uh, maneuvering taking maybe 10 minutes. And then while this do, do this, I can run P40. And uh, quickly see if I get time. I've probably forgotten something. We'll see. All right, we reach it. Five seconds. I'm not sure NASA would be happy. But now you can see I'm burning in the correct direction on the dark side of the moon to kind of reach uh, Earth and get back home. And you can see that I applied some things there. Uh, this will change pretty soon. But uh, you can see that I've been working on this system that allows uh, uh, these things to kind of glow up in the dark, which is kind of, it's, it looks kind of neat, I think. All right, uh, the burn is usually quite long, so I'm not going to wait for it. That's uh, something that you can do yourself. All right, and then uh, the other thing that we've all been uh, waiting for is the upgrade of the command service module. So you've already seen part of it as I uh, uh, kind of went through these things. Uh, we saw the optics and where they are, but now I want to get kind of a proper tour uh, into a cold and dark state of uh, the command module. So with that, I'm going to load one of the new states which is, uh, if I now go into missions, free play, and then the minus two hours. Uh, so I've been working very hard uh, <laughs> together with my wife uh, to get all of uh, the realistic checklists into the game. And of course, it's uh, very hard to bring them all in, uh, but we're kind of focusing on uh, bringing in the most important ones as the systems are added. And every time I design a system in the command and service module, or even the lunar module, or the other crafts, I try to use these checklists as kind of a reference on how everything were operated, and of course a manual on how the internals works. So this is now going to spend a little bit of time loading uh, and just give it that. I'm going to hit F1, quickly show you kind of the exterior of how this all looks. You can see that we're now on Cape. Um, it's some differences here, not much. I'm, I'm planning on doing some upgrades on this entire tower. And there's some uh, visual 
artifacts all around us, but that's something I of course plan to fix. But systems first and, and of course playability. But you can see that this entire uh, arm has changed. So you can see uh, it has quite a lot of details. And if I now go inside of the cockpit, uh, you see that the state has loaded into a call in dark state. And uh, uh, one of the new features I have is uh, the ability to save and load states. Uh, let's see, where is it? Yeah, command module panel state and lunar module panel state. So you can basically, any state that you want uh, or store for yourself, uh, if you're having preferred things, you can save this and you can la load into an, a state at any given time. This basically just presses all the buttons that you need to press to get into that state. And uh, you're able to then create a state and use this when you load uh, something from uh, the mission and the mission editor which is also something that comes with this new update. You can see uh, the Apollo mission editor is now part of this entire thing. It works the same way as you're used to from, uh, from Mercury and Gemini. For those who have tried this, I know that there's, it's not many, but you can basically say, this is what you see in the menu and in the mission pad. This is the briefing. You have the timeline. You can go in here and say that uh, after twi 25 seconds, I want the commander to say hello world and then uh, you can these are just toggles so it just shows the visibility every single l uh, command that you do in an uh, event is uh, it can be tied into an SFX which is an OGG sound effect that is a relative path to the file name so this means that you can basically narrate your entire mission if you want or even uh, cut original audio from real missions and tie this with uh, actions or messages or things in the game. And for example, I want this to proceed when, for example, the command module cockpit has a pin or maybe a knob set to AC indicator is set to something. Or it can be that uh, uh, you have some requested burns, you have TLI waiting for that, stuff like this. Of course, this is kind of advanced, so I'll make a separate video series pretty soon. I know I said that for a while, but now I finally have these mission editors in the game, and I can start documenting this. So, with that, we can go back into the cockpit. So what you can see now is uh, the interior of the command module in a cold and dark state. You cannot see outside the windows. You can see a little bit outside this thing because uh, there's part of this launch escape system that's missing. Same applies for the other window and of course the hatch itself. And this is the white room. We saw this in the intro. You can look in there. And uh, if you want to do a cold and dark start, uh, what usually happens is that you want to go in and toggle away the seats because it, it's the backup crew that basically comes in here and uh, and does this. So you want, don't want to have seats in the way. And then a lot of the initial checklists of the entire cold and dark procedure is located in the back of this entire thing. And you you do have a flashlight as well. And you can come in here and you can, you know, open some panels and do some switches. Uh, you know, you can see that there's a lot of things going on here. And a lot of these things are hooked into system that systems that are modeled either in a very simple way or uh, modeled uh, with even physics and on a deeper level. But there's a lot of things that uh, happens under the hood here. Uh, so in 0 0.8, I hope to fix a lot of uh, uh, additional systems that I didn't get time for in this update and then um, kind of see where uh, where it goes. So if I now open the checklists, you have this entire activation and uh, backup crew pre-launch thing uh, that has all the checklists that you need to run through in order to be able to set this up. And uh, uh, we're all used to kind of how this works. So I'm not going to run too much through all uh, all of this, but you have the EMS pre-launch tests. Uh, the EMS has received a full overhaul, uh, so you can basically go in and set this up for your Delta V maneuvers, and it will be much more accurate than it used to be. And this is really good if you're doing transposition uh, and docking, or 
uh, docking with a lunar module or even manual delta v's or mid course uh, correction birds uh, because uh, one of the things that you can do now is to use the mission or the maneuver planner in orbit and uh, plan a burn but if you don't want to set up the entire SPS, if it's a small bur burn, you might want to use the RCS. And you can do this manually here. If, for example, the primary system would fail, you can turn this on into normal mode. You can uh, either set the delta V you want to achieve or just hit into delta V yourself and then see what this number counts to when you're doing prograde or retro retrograde burns. So there's quite a lot of those things. The EMS is the Earth. Uh, entry monitoring system which basically is showing you a graph of your entry trajectory and it's also showing you range or your delta velocity but it's also a tool used in flight for doing manual burns or seeing the range uh, when you're in VHF range mode uh, which is basically something that you do when you do rendezvous again with the lunar module after the lunar module is ascending from the lunar surface so that's a very useful feature and the Academy takes you through this uh, when it comes to that aspect. All right, uh, the other thing that you can do here in Cold and Dark is uh, that you can toggle the hatch because uh, it's fun, basically. It looks nice. There we have it. Pretty cool. And the hatch and the the interior model is based on the Smithsonian uh, models uh, together with the my existing module. So I spent quite a lot of time kind of fusing and welding these things together to kind of get the best of both worlds. And then also, of course, making sure that it's possible to render that thing in real time. So I'm going to turn on uh, the flashlight here. If I now go under into the lower equipment bay, you can see that a lot of these fuses are that were used to be missing, these panels were all empty before. They are all now added. And of course a lot of them actually works too. Same applies for these things on the side. Uh, you have quite a lot around here. Uh, these are filled up. Down here you have panels, you have the panel under that cover I showed you, there's some things on over on this side, stuff like that. And then uh, this one also has some details. And then of course the entire thing to get into the lunar module, which is kind of nice. And if I now go into end session, and if, uh, let's see, uh, settings. Uh, to enable this new cockpit, you will have to double check that uh, the effects and then uh, the command module internal, uh, this is a bug here, uh, the command module interior is set to historical and now uh, not the low poly one. I kept the low poly there, but it's not 100% functional anymore because uh, a lot of the new lower equipment bay switches and things like that are still missing from this so i'm going to try to apply these things into the low poly model because i assume that if i ever do vr for apollo then the low poly mod module would probably be a good thing to still have all right and then i'm going to hit back so that was the uh improved command module cockpit. Uh, I'm, I don't want to show it all light lit up and nice and beautiful. I want you to just go in there and get the experience yourself and, and try to enjoy it properly. Uh, just spend some time in there, look around, look at the details. Uh, there's still a lot of work that I need to do on the mod model itself and cleaning textures and modifying textures. And I, I might even uh, provide some of these modifications back to uh, Smithsonian for others to use as well. Uh, another thing that I did in this update is uh, a simplified <laughs> lunar module exam because I know that it has been extremely hard. I think the statistics is 2% or is it less than 1% that has been able to complete this exam. 
uh, is brutally hard because uh, you need to understand a lot of things before you're able to actually land this thing on the moon. So I decided to simplify the exam a little bit and, uh, and then you'll learn how to land on the mo moon uh, through the academy uh, instead and then try it out in this exam and then once we start playing the campaign uh, in for example 0 0.8 I hope to add a new campaign as well campaign 4 uh, no promises of course but this is my plan uh, campaign 4 which kind of brings in a lot of things uh, when it comes to the lunar module because right now we only seen uh, yeah there is the, uh, the statistic 0.9% has completed the simplified lunar module exam which is not too many. All right, next slide. Uh, the Mercury Control Center Live is now going out of public alpha testing, which means that it's now going to be a constant part of re-entry. I made some significant changes into how the versioning thing works and the connection logic here, because based on the feedback uh, from the, the alpha testing rounds. So that's pretty cool. Uh, thank you all for playing uh, Mercury Control Center Live together. Uh, I learned a lot by doing it. And uh, I must say that probably was some of my favorite mo moments in re-entry has been through the Mercury Control Center. Even as a spectator watching <laughs> some of you guys doing really realistic procedures and ways of talking with the capsule, the Capcom, you know, talking with the the capsule air or the, the astronaut you know uh, the way that you talk is really realistic and I found that very fascinating so that's cool uh, which is why I also plan on uh, uh, hopefully setting up a room after this session uh, where I think I will at least join in and, and play and uh, probably Martin as well I, I'm not sure but we'll see this is go we're gonna organize this in discord but uh, this is gonna be after the stream so I'll get back to that soon. Uh, some other things. Uh, I've briefly touched upon a lot of these things already. Uh, but uh, just to sum up, uh, there's at least 50 new uh, checklists applied to the Apollo program. Uh, we do have the cold and dark setup and the panel state system that I showed you earlier. Uh, one of the major things about 0 0.75 is the, cold, uh, the groundwork for 0 0.8 and 0 0.8 is the actual Apollo systems update so 0 0.75 kind of tries to make Apollo work again first of all because uh, when I did a lot of the TSS changes for Mercury and Gemini I broke a lot of things in Apollo naturally because it was still running on the old engine while part of it was on the new engine and that didn't go very very well. So what I did uh, was to make sure that 0 0.75 then fixes a lot of these things so things that used to work before now works again and then of course I added these new things uh, that you saw already uh, but it's basically the groundwork that we we need to have to be able to work on 0 0.8 which is of course the Apollo systems. Then I had the in-game Apollo editor I showed you, RefSmat, which is uh, the the stable stable matrix, or is the IMU orientation or the platform that uh, you see attitude relative to. So when something says that you have pitch 75 degrees, you're 75 degrees pitch offset from this platform. Then you have P52, option one and three. And I also made a preliminary support for P 51 as well uh, you you can see it in the game uh, but of course this is still a partial thing okay so I was thinking that we could spend a little uh, time on talking about uh, kind of things that can happen going forward so with 75 behind us I can finally start to look ahead and the entire TSS thing has made re-entry uh, reach a new level when it comes to realism. It's uh, it's not the best yet, but hopefully each of these updates takes us closer and closer to being very realistic at the same time as it's fun. So when we're thinking about the future, the, uh, the near term is going to be a lot about Apollo, but I also want to 
go back and fix some bugs that you have been reporting in Gemini and Mercury and the Mercury Control Center as well. So now I can finally get out of this extremely big update cycle and start adding patches again, uh, maybe even on a weekly basis if, is ne if needed, or I can roll out hot patches. The problem with TSS is that it had prevented me to, to do so, because TSS basically requires me to pull uh, the entire game apart and then do some changes and then wire things together in a completely different way and that requires a lot of work especially in Apollo considering you know it has Earth, it has Moon, it has orbital mechanics around those two bodies uh, it has uh, you know the command module and the, uh, the lunar module and one thing that I actually forgot to mention earlier is that the entire Saturn stack has also received a good overhaul when it comes to systems. You won't notice it and you won't see it unless you pay close attention to uh, when the F1s ignite uh, on the start. Uh, you can see that it actually has a very realistic startup sequence. The engines are ignited in pairs with a few milliseconds uh, in between. Uh, two of them and then the two other ones and then lastly one engine so not all of the engines are started at the same time and all of this data now is, exists and is quite detailed and the same applies for uh, the second stage and the third stage uh, and so on so that has also received a little bit of a systems overhaul but much more uh, will be added in 0 0.8 as well from uh, when it comes to the Saturn V stack Uh, I also see that there's a mentioning of uh, typos. Yes, we've been running through a lot of typos in the academy and the checklists. Uh, more to come, of course. Uh, the the thing is that uh, when I've been creating those uh, in a very my very limited schedule, I've been focusing quite a lot of kind of creating the functionality. But then, uh, of course, I need content and academy and stuff to help us. So uh, I try to kind of just brute force myself through typing these things and then uh, when the project is, is in the start phase I have the entire vision and my plan ahead of me which has made me kind of skip a lot of uh, fixing typos things but now I have finally been able to get into a good pace on that so you will see a lot of more fixes coming up and uh, that same applies for the manuals in 0 0.8 I hope to uh, add the mis these missing systems to the manuals and then of course rewrite some sections that are very coarse to to put it that way but 0 0.75 is in the start phase uh, we're going to roll this out uh, right after this stream so uh, you'll get to test the bits pretty soon but uh, an, an important fact is that as you can see this update is brutally large. There's a lot to it. And I've been spending a lot of time trying to tie all of this together, uh, which means that uh, you will find issues. And when you find issues, please report them to me so I can fix them. We have a bugs channel on Discord. We have the, the uh, boards on, on, on Steam, uh, the Steam group for the community. Uh, you have my email, uh, just reach out and let me know so I can fix it because in the end uh, my goal is to make this as good as possible and the only way I can do that is by getting the feedback uh, from, from you guys. So and of course a uh, big thank you for all uh, who has already done this. Uh, in 0 0.8 I will be then of course looking at uh, some of the ECS systems, uh, some of the startup procedures for the command and service module right now. Uh, it's okay but it still needs work so you will uh, get some overhauls on that front and then I want to do some minor quirks and stuff on the AGC and the LGC and the entire lunar uh, mod module and that, fr and that aspect because today we've been mostly looking at the CSM. However, the Luna module has received a lot of attention during the 0 0.75 development cycle. Uh, it has uh, improved systems, uh, better landing uh, radar, uh, and things like that, uh, trajectory calculations, stuff to make landing possible again. Uh, because before, uh, in the, the public builds right now, that has not been possible because of some issues with the landing. There's still some uh, issues uh, that we're looking into. But uh, of course, we'll just work through all of this together. Uh, 
So since this is the last update on TSS, finally, of course I need to work on it and improve it and fix issues, but finally TSS is behind us and I can focus on the product instead of mechanics. I spent a year working on these mechanics. So I decided to spend a little bit of time uh, looking into the history of TSS. Can anyone guess what spacecraft in re-entry was the first spacecraft to receive the TSS engine? What was the first spacecraft that uh, uh, got the true scale system applied to it? And I know that Martin had a quiz out there somewhere. I think that he, yeah, he even posted uh, a link to it there. I see we have some suggestions. Uh, we have uh, Mercury, Vostok. There's quite a few Vostoks. Mercury. So the first update that rolled out with TSS in public hands was Mercury. So I'm not going to say that Mercury is incorrect. However, the first rocket in re-entry was Vostok. And the thing with Vostok was um, that since Mercury, Gemini and Apollo was in public bits, I had to work a lot on the TSS when it comes to a research phase uh, with something else. So what I did was to, instead of breaking the game, I created a new project on the side and I tried to play around with ideas. And this was not using Vostok at all. This was using boxes and, and cubes uh, with a very simple particle engine as the launch vehicle. And I used that uh, when I kind of did research and in inventing some of the things that I needed uh, with TSS. And TSS is just a name. TSS is actually my a part of my game engine. It's the integration between the physics and the rendering. And that's just a component that makes it possible to render stuff from the uh, physics engine. So it required a lot of research. And as I was making re-entry from the start, uh, you know, the first uh, thing, for example, in Mercury, in the old engine, things were working okay and then Gemini came into the picture and I started working on that. The engine was giving me a little bit of headaches but I still managed to get through, you know. Uh, Gemini is a little bit more advanced than Mercury. It requires me to rendezvous in space. It requires me to dock with another satellite in orbit. Uh, so it added a little bit more headache to it but it was fine. But then Apollo came uh, with the moon and traveling to the moon with its 380,000 kilometers of distance uh, and you need the precision of uh, centimeters, right? So that's where things started to pull up. And I probably spent three or four months in total in Apollo alone, just figuring out to work around my old engine because my old engine was working against me. So I created a new project and I started uh, doing the research and the things that I learned from creating those that old engine and applied it into something I called TSS. And then I started creating, just for fun, Vostok. And Vostok was actually then the first spacecraft to ever receive the TSS support. So with that, I think that I'm going to just quickly jump into Vostok. So this is the other project. I will do not know when this will be released. I know that some of you might have even seen this before. Uh, but uh, the priorities are, of course, uh, Apollo, Gemini and Mercury right now. But of course, during, you know, code lockdowns, for example, now that the bits has been in the hands of the test pilots, I kind of like to do something completely different or else I'm going to get demotivated or uh, burned out from all the intense work that is required by just getting a lunar module to land on the moon. Uh, so now I'm going to just unpause this. And we'll see if it works. Yes, it does work. It's just that uh, I'm having some issues. There we go. So this is Vostok. And I've never showed this before. 
So let me just see if this, yeah, now this, uh, I've lost control of my mouse cursor. There we go. So just to show the exterior, uh, this is kind of the VIP version of how all this looks. As I mentioned, I don't know when this will reach the hands of, of the public, uh, but at least it worked well when it come, came to developing TSS. So inside of this, uh, I've been uh, trying to put together uh, a couple of these components. I made this panel here, for example, which is the control panel. And this is actually functional. You can do a lot of things with it. Uh, on in front of you, you have kind of uh, the signal lights that allows you to see if there's something wrong or if everything is okay. You have some indicators. You have a clock uh, with the day and night cycle and the orbit counter, uh, things like that. You have the visor down here, which allows you to orientate the spacecraft in space. And then you have kind of the joystick. And then you have a couple of things that I've not yet modeled, uh, but you see there's a radio here. And I was thinking that it would be fun eventually, uh, when I get the time to do this, to be able to hook this up with actual radio, internet radio stations, maybe even in Russian, uh, where you can al listen to radio uh, when you're orbiting Earth. So I'm going to just time scale a little bit here. Whoop. That was a little bit too much. I'm streaming at the same time, so let me just get in there. The stream isn't very helpful on that. Yes, so now we are ascending. And uh, the window shutters are closed. Uh, and then on the outside here, uh, I'm not able to see out uh, on this side because of uh, uh, the fairings that are outside. But on the back side here, you can actually see this. And I'm going to ascend this a little bit up into not fully orbit. Uh, the Vostok spends. 15 minutes on getting into orbit. It's quite slow. So um, I'm not going to spend that time right now. But of course I can make, make some dedicated videos on this if you're interested. And if you're of course interested in seeing Vostok in, in re-entry at all. I'm not sure. It's, it was my test project and it made TSS and it, TSS made re-entry probably a thousand times better in my opinion. But I do want to see some staging. And this is TSS all the way. You can see that I can zoom a lot. Can you guys hear the noise or is it too loud? I am also running. All right, there we go. Oh, my PC is struggling with this streaming. I'm gonna, while this is ascending, I'm just going to quickly exit this instance. Now I'm just waiting for the fairings. Right, the fairings are gone. And uh, 
the way that this works is uh, and I'll take down the volume the uh, thing here is that this consists of two ways of looking out so you have the middle camera that is uh, focused and then you have the outside which is a mirror that allows you to orient the spacecraft with the uh, with the, the earth horizon in the entire 360 degrees which allows you to then orientate the spacecraft and then you can uh, i think i remember if i remember correctly this you can change the brightness of this i don't actually remember it because it's been a while since i worked on this Um, and then you can, uh, for example, here you can turn off uh, the shutters. And that's this window. And of course, you can turn off the visor as well. And then you can go all submarine mode if you want. Uh, you can do a light test on the indicators and uh, I spent quite a lot of time uh, based on material that I've received from some of the community I've been talking with people uh, a lot with uh, SV Gustav on the channel he's been helping me a lot with this uh, I think it was was it last summer or the summer before I don't remember uh, but uh, this one is not the same as you can see in any other Vostok simulator There we go. And uh, the cool thing about this is that it has quite a lot of things when it comes to how the RCS works. And uh, it's uh, only one way of operating it, and that's the uh, uh, rate command. And uh, once you push the stick, it will take one second before any of the thrusters are fired. So it's kind of clunky to, f to fly in that way, but it's very genius when it comes to the design. Uh, this is very automatic. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can override and do yourself, of course, by the using these switches. And there's uh, backup systems in case uh, the automatic uh, retrograde burn doesn't work, for example. And uh, the retrograde wor burn works uh, by some sensors that it detects the angle uh, to the sun relative uh, to your attitude that will trigger the burn to start happening and uh, there's these marks you can see around this clock that will help you guide this and this is kind of the last orbit and then it will trigger some systems and to do some self-testing and do the uh, fire the retrograde engine this is uh, mostly about uh, climate and then uh, gas uh, analyzer. The only way for this one to work is to use the gas analyzer here, uh, which will then give you a state of the CO2 in the cockpit, oxy oxygen levels, pre atmosphere pressure. Uh, this is the in instrument section outside. And this is all propellant that's left in the different uh, systems. All right, and that's Vostok and the history of TSS. And uh, I want to say thank you, Vostok, and thank you for uh, this entire journey of uh, you know being my pal through the TSS development. It's been a lot of fun. With that, I'm going to end the official stream today. Uh, we talked a little bit about 0 0.70 fem, uh, 75. Uh, we talked a little bit about 0 0.8 and looked uh, ahead in the short term. Then we also saw kind of the Vostok thing and uh, there's still a lot of work left there to be done uh, when it comes to, you know, that making it into re-entry as an of official spacecraft. But if the interest is there, then I and I get the time and I get, you know, some of the major Apollo quirks out of the way, uh, then uh, who knows, it might even make it into the game. 
Uh, I do want to give a quick shout out uh, to the test pilot who has been working immensely on this latest update. Uh, the moderators who have been helping me offload a lot of the work uh, when it comes to the Discord community itself uh, by allowing me to kind of focus on the project. So I, uh, that's really valuable to be able to focus my time on the product. And then of course all the contributors who has been able to give amazing content to the game. Uh, we created a new contributors program that allows people to see things that I could need. And if you want to help, you can, you can help out by contributing. Uh, this is all vol volunteer basis. There's no requirements. Uh, but it's kind of a way to allow people to help out because I probably get asked every single day that uh, people have stuff they want to share with the game. Uh, of course, all the members in Discord, all your feedback, your discussions, your jokes, uh, uh, just being part of uh, this entire thing uh, gives me a lot uh, of motivation. It, uh, it's amazing to see this many uh, people in the Discord channel. We uh, reached our 1,000 one member mark uh, over the holidays or in January or something like that. And of course, to you, uh, the players, you know, you who who have both re-entry and supported me that way and are actually enjoying uh, this product as a whole. I know that it's a lot of rough edges. There's a lot of things that needs attention. Uh, you need a lot of patience because I'm a you know one-man dev. Uh, which makes that things takes a little bit of time so I do thank you a lot for your patience and uh, and stuff and in total you know all of you are you know part of this journey and uh, makes this possible so thank you for ma making this happen happen with that I want to uh, end the official stream and then I'm going to go into Discord. I have two things in line. Uh, I'm going to do a static fire test uh, on a couple of things. And then I'm going to start a new Mercury Control Center live session. Well, uh, we as a community can just get together, uh, play and have a little bit fun uh, with re-entry. But before any of that, I am going to release the 0 0.75 bits. So. Once I hit stop on the stream, I'm going to switch computers and I'm going to probably spend five minutes on just uh, verifying everything and I'm going to hit the publish button. So within the next five to ten minutes, you will be able to see these bits in your own hands. So anyways, thank you a lot and thanks for playing re-entry.